So I'm going to first try and position this whole project in a larger context. And I'm going to start from the very bottom. We happen to inhabit a universe which, at the physical level, organizes itself into all sorts of different things. And some of these physical entities happen to organize themselves into molecules, and then you get the chemical level of organization. And then some of these molecules organize themselves into living organisms, and then you get the biological level of organization. Then some of these creatures develop neural networks capable of thinking, and these creatures organize themselves into societies. And these societies, they produce all sorts of interesting things, like family, friendship, economy, politics. Among other things, these societies are capable of producing science, in particular the end product of science, which is the scientific mosaic. Now, what is this thing, the scientific mosaic? Essentially, the scientific mosaic is the whole collection of theories that a certain scientific community accepts at a certain moment of time, and methods of theory evaluation, the methods they employ to decide whether a theory is acceptable or not. So if I asked you today which theories you think best describe the world around us, you probably mention some of this. General relativity, quantum physics, cosmology and astronomy, chemistry, genetics, biology, neurophysiology, psychology, sociology, economics, history, mathematics. And we would also probably mention the hypothetical deductive method among other methods that we employ nowadays to decide whether a theory is any good. Now I'm going to zoom out, and this would be now. If we were to go back in time, let's say 250 years ago in this case, among other things, we'll probably notice Newtonian physics, phlogiston theory, theory of preformation, theology, which was part of their science. For them, it wasn't something foreign to science. It was just part of the same scientific enterprise of understanding the world around them. Then I'm going to zoom out, and you have your Cartesian worldview, and all the way back to the 1500s, when you get your Aristotelian medieval worldview. And here you would have the Aristotelian physics of four elements, geocentric cosmology, astrology was part of the university curriculum. So this is the picture that we get. This is where the mosaic is. It's at the one of the highest levels of organization. Now the thing is, every one of these levels has a proper science about it. Every one of them. For this level, you have physics. Then you have chemistry. Then you have biology. For this level, you have psychology. For this level, you have all sorts of social science, economics, political science, sociology, all different social sciences that study different ways human beings organize. So my question today is, what would it be like to have a proper science of this level of organization? If it is a level of organization and it shows certain general patterns of behavior, which we believe it does, then shouldn't we have a proper science about it? And for the lack of a better term, we're going to call it scientonomy. I apologize, but scientology is already taken, so it's nothing <laughs> we can do about it. So what could this science of science possibly be like? My answer is that just like any other science, we need to have an observational level and a theoretical level. There is no other way. You cannot have just an observational level, just gather data, and you cannot simply have a theoretical level. You need both. Theoretical scientonomy, this is the branch of scientonomy that will attempt to uncover the general patterns, the general laws that govern the process. And you also need observational scientonomy that will focus on reconstructing individual mosaics and changes in them. The first one you're already familiar with. This is what we've been doing for the last four years, at least we're trying to do. And this is a snapshot of what we do have at the moment. At the moment, we have the four laws. So these would be your axioms and the theorems that follow. And this includes many theorems on many different aspects of the process of scientific change. This is what we already have. What we don't seem to have is this one, observational sea antonomy. I think the major task of observational sea antonomy is to reconstruct what can be called the tree of knowledge. I'm going to explain this. What is this thing, the tree of knowledge? This is the tree of knowledge. Ideally, we want to be able to reconstruct the content and evolution of any scientific mosaic at any moment of the history of science. So if I zoom out and take a timeline, it would be great if we could have a website that would allow us to click on any year. Let's say we go back to the middle of the 17th century, 1650, and be able to say that there existed, for the sake of argument, four different scientific communities at the time, 
let's say there was Catholic Aristotelian in most of the continent here. In England, you would have Anglican Aristotelian. Then in the Northern Europe, you would have Protestant Aristotelian. And maybe in the Ottoman Empire, you would have Islamic Aristotelian. I'm not sure about that, but I assume it would be Islamic Aristotelian. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could have a software that would allow us to click on any one of them, and it tells you both the social organization of this community, the members, institutions, how things were organized, how the knowledge was produced and taught to next generations. This would include the science production and the university system, everything. And also, importantly, the content of their mosaic, the beliefs they had about the world and methods they employed in evaluating those beliefs. Wouldn't it be great to have this? And then obviously this would also let us trace the evolution of every community and every mosaic. So in this case, 1720, and you see the transition. In England, they're already Newtonian. In France, they are Catholic Cartesian. In the uh, Northern Europe, they are Protestant Cartesian. And I assume in the Ottoman Empire around 1720, they would still be Islamic Aristotelian. So this is the tree of knowledge. Let's just appreciate that this project is gonna be on the same scale of complexity as similar projects from other fields of inquiry. This would include things like astronomical catalogs. Nowadays, we already have those. There are several astronomical catalogs for galaxies, planets, stars, other objects. We already have that. It's also gonna be similar to the world history atlases when you have an atlas of political maps throughout the history. I'm gonna show you an example of that. And finally, it's gonna be very similar to the tree of life that biologists have recently put together. So this is a project of the same level of complexity because essentially what it requires from us, observational sea autonomists, is to know for every moment of time, not just the list of communities, but also the full, the comprehensive set of beliefs that they had. And this is a task that can never be completed. We understand that, but one has to start somewhere. I'm gonna give you some examples. So this is a world history atlas. You have the political map of Europe and some parts of Asia as it is nowadays. And you can choose any year and it gives you a political map of this region for that year, I would say with a very good precision. So let's go back in time. This is what you would have in 1900, 1700, 1500, see the Holy Roman Empire there, 1300, 11, 900, 700, 500, you can go all the way to Roman times, you see my Armenia there, and uh, even to the days of Roman Republic. The atlas covers 5,000 years. It takes you all the way back to 3000 BC. So this already exists. Tree of Life, that's another example of a successful project of this magnitude. This is a website, it has a comprehensive tree of all the organisms that we believe exist or ever existed. You have cellular organisms here, or you can choose the eukaryota, and it has all the references and stuff, so it's extremely complex and extremely detailed. So you have tree of life on the one hand, and then you have, no, you don't have, but you can have a tree of knowledge on the other hand. So my question is, if we believe it is important to invest millions of dollars, time, effort, energy, in reconstructing the features of all the minute species, millions of types of insects, thousand types of cockroaches. If we think that is important, and I'm not saying it's not important. I'm not saying it's not important. It is extremely important. But if that is important, is it not equally important to invest time and energy in reconstructing the history of human knowledge? Isn't it at least equally important and equally interesting? So this is the question. Now, if we appreciate that, then we also have to appreciate that just as the biological tree of life wouldn't have been possible without a serious theoretical foundation, there's no way you can have a tree of life without a serious evolutionary theory. The scientonomic tree of knowledge is also impossible without a proper theoretical foundation. This also needs to be appreciated. You can only have one when you have the other. So you have two sides of sea antonomy, and observational and theoretical sea autonomy cannot exist without one another. Now, why is that? Why is it that you cannot have the tree of knowledge without a proper theoretical foundation? I want to make this part very clear because many people are confused and they think, especially among those of us who are historians, they seem to believe that you can have a proper observational sea autonomy or a history of science as they call it these days. You can have that without proper theoretical foundation. This is a common myth, 
and it needs to be debunked once and for all. There is a famous phenomenon of theory relatedness, and we should know better than anyone that there is nothing you can say about the world unless you have a theory that lets you interpret that. There is no such thing as a pure statement of fact, and we know this from the history of science, at least we are supposed to know this. So this is something not to be ignored. So what is theory relatedness? Let's take a very basic phenomenon and let's ask a question. What's going on in here? Well, you know that the answer to this question is going to depend on the theory that you accept. If you are with Newtonian physics, then the answer is going to be that what you actually see here is an apple that is moving with acceleration, being pulled by the Earth's gravity, and this is what you see if you are with Newton. Nowadays, we would provide a different explanation to this. Strictly speaking, nowadays we believe that there is no such thing as gravity. There's just curved space-time continuum. Massive objects curve the space-time continuum around them, and as a result of that, the apple is in a state of inertial motion in this curved space-time continuum. And finally, if we were to go back in time 500 years ago, the Aristotelian physics would probably describe this as a case of a heavy body descending towards the center of the universe. Heavy body meaning a combination of Earth, water, so this is the overall picture that we get. Observational physics, theoretical physics. When interpreting and explaining physical phenomena, one it or not, we rely on our accepted physical theories. There is no other way of doing this thing. So why is it that we need theoretical physics? It provides us with at least three things. First, it gives you a unified taxonomy. So when you go out there and observe things, physical things, let's say you observe this, you don't start thinking, okay, how do I even describe this? Should I focus on a color? Should I focus on a smell, on a taste of this? Or should I focus on mass and acceleration? What should I focus on? Your theoretical physics decides that. It gives you universal taxonomy, it gives you the explanatory tools, and it tells you what aspects of this you have to focus on when you make your observation. Think of astronomical catalogs. Each astronomical object has certain properties. Who decides which properties are important? Well, it's your accepted theoretical beliefs decide that you have to focus on brightness, on mass, on other parameters. You don't just say, in my study, I'm going to focus on this. No, it's your theoretical framework that decides which parameters are important and which parameters are not important. So if your task is to study falling apples, you're probably going to be focusing on mass. You're going to be ignoring the color. You're going to be ignoring the brand of an apple. Now, this is true for every combination of observational and theoretical science. Here you have experience, here you have a theory. For biological phenomena, it's exactly the same thing. You have observational biology and you have theoretical biology. So when we reconstruct the tree of life, we rely on our accepted biological theory in a way that the accepted biological theory gives you your universal vocabulary, your taxonomy. And it also gives you the explanatory tools and it helps to understand which features of organisms to focus on. This is decided by your currently accepted theory. It doesn't mean that those theories are written in stone. No, those theories change. But the thing is, at any moment of time, it's your current theoretical view that decides what's important and what's not important. So this needs to be clarified. The same thing, I believe, exists in our field, or at least it has to exist in our field. There is no other way. To reconstruct the tree of knowledge, we need three things. We need a unified vocabulary. We need explanatory tools and a way of knowing which historical details to focus on. Should I focus on the color of Galileo's wallet? Should I focus on whether he was married or not? Should I focus on the fact that he was in the Medici court? Are those things important or not? This thing should be decided by the theoretical framework that you accept. There is no other way. Otherwise, it's just a random decision. And only theoretical scientonomy can provide you with that. Now, today the problem is that despite vast historical scholarship, at the moment there is little data to reconstruct the tree of knowledge. There is little data. And the reason is that nowadays we mostly produce narratives, but very little in terms of data. The difference between the two is very important. Unless we understand that difference, we're not going to move forward. You have data, you have narrative. Data requires, among other things, a universal taxonomy. Now, try to put together a database of history. I'm not even talking about any elaborate databases. Suppose you want to put together an Excel sheet. The first thing that you have to clarify for yourself is the columns. Okay, the rows are your objects or events. The first thing you have to decide is what you're going to have in the columns. Are you going to be focusing on years, on individuals? What are the features that you're going to be focusing on? 
So any historical database assumes the existence of a universal vocabulary in the field. Now look at the contemporary narratives. There is no universal taxonomy. Different historical narratives often use completely different terminologies. Some can talk about the reception of a theory, others can talk about the acceptance of a theory, others can talk about what theories were taught at certain time periods, and you remain wondering whether these different vocabularies are actually mutually translatable. So it doesn't really give you data. If you keep your information in a textual format, you're going to have this problem. The only way to fight it is to have a universal taxonomy so that different historical studies contribute to the same goal. So you can extract data from them and put in the same database. Another thing that you need for data is conceptual precision. So no database is possible without precisely defined concepts. What do you mean by theory? What do you mean by method? What do you mean by acceptance? What do you mean by community? Nowadays in our narratives, we have conceptual vagueness. Even in the same narrative, I'm not talking across narratives, just in the same narrative. It's very difficult to figure out when people talk about acceptance, use, pursuit, are all these stances the same stance or are they different stances? Nobody knows. Finally, data is always guided by accepted theory. So obtaining new data from existing data is impossible without a theory. Think how astronomers measure the mass of a certain star. There is no direct way of measuring it and still it's considered data. The reason and the way they do it, they observe certain qualities, such as brightness and the way it moves and other things, and from those directly observable qualities. They deduce, using the theories they accept, they deduce other observable qualities. And mass is one of them. Try to do something like that in the contemporary narratives. It's almost impossible because you don't have a guiding theory. So no piece of evidence gives you a chance to connect it to another piece of evidence or deduce another piece of data. You just have single data points if you're lucky, but no way of connecting them. Because the only way you can say that this leads to that is if you have a general law that tells you in cases X, Y happens all the time or most of the time. But you can do that only if you have a theory. So the diagnosis is that extracting data from narratives is virtually impossible. You want to have this, but at the moment you have that. Now, suppose it's your task to reconstruct the mosaic of, let's say, Paris around 1720s. There is no way you can Google that. Your best bet would be, nowadays, to delve into hefty volumes on the early 18th century science and hope to read about accepted theories in between the lines, because whether a theory was accepted or not is usually not the major focus in those narratives. They're written with different purposes in mind. So if you really want to reconstruct the belief system of that community, you really have to start reading between the lines. And very often that is not enough. So what you end up doing, you end up delving into the archives yourself. And good luck with that if you're not a historian. If you ask me, I think it must be an easier way. In astronomy, we have that way. In social sciences, we have that way. We have the tree of life in biology. It shouldn't be this difficult, should it? The way it is nowadays, when I have to go into the archives to reconstruct this, in my opinion, this is only slightly better than uh, making a long pilgrimage to a holy site and learning the sacred knowledge from the master for many decades. That's pretty much the option we have at the moment. Delve into the archives and good luck with that. Ideally, there must be a website. I click on a date, a year, and I get, to our best knowledge, the state of their knowledge. That's the way it should be. The diagnosis is that we need both. Now the question is, how do we get there? And what I'm gonna give you today is a toolbox of Scientonomy. These are the tools that I believe we need to get the whole thing started. And you need all of them. We need a wiki, we need a database, we need a seminar, a journal, and a workshop. So these are the tools that I believe we need to make this project possible. I'm going to start with a database. This is the most obvious. We need a database that would allow us to do the following. To retrieve the list of all scientific communities that existed in any given year. So you give it a year and it gives you a list of communities that we believe existed at the time. Then the second thing is a mosaic by community and year. So retrieve the scientific mosaic for any given scientific community in any given year. You have a community, you know that it existed a certain period of time, you choose a year and it gives you their belief system. And then for every mosaic to trace the splits and merges, how communities split into two communities, how they merge, we need a database to trace the evolution. 
The next thing we need is a wiki. While the database is a nice way of keeping our historical knowledge, the data of the observational sea antonomy, you also need a place to keep your theoretical knowledge and the current state of it. And I think the best way of doing that is an encyclopedia, is a wiki. It would allow us to outline the currently accepted knowledge concerning the mechanism of scientific change, know what is accepted, know what has changed, in other words, trace and document all the modifications in our knowledge on the subject. So if we happen to change one of the laws in the future, we need to keep track of our own history. So the wiki is a very nice format for that. And finally, know what is unknown. Catalog all the open questions in the field of sea antonomy to assist future research. So if we believe that there is an open question that should also be included in a wiki. Now, if you compare what happens in proper science as opposed to what happens in, let's say, philosophy, in proper science, there are always accepted views. Yes, there are tons of things scientists debate about, but at any moment of time, there are tons of things that they agree on. So they have an accepted mosaic. They know what they accept and they try to improve on it. They try to make it better. The next generation doesn't start from scratch. They start from where the previous generation has left. In philosophy, unfortunately, we often criticize without even knowing what is accepted and what isn't accepted. So as a result, you get little progress, but what you really get is proliferation of different views. Try to think of any accepted view in philosophy. Fallibilism is probably the only thing that comes to mind. Other than that, there's very little in terms of accepted in philosophy. And this is not something to be proud of. This is something really unfortunate. That's why we've been in the business for 2,500 years and we have very little to show. <laughs> so the recipe is to stop proliferating, start improving. And that requires accepted views. You need to know what it is that you know these days know what the problems are, and try to make it better. A piecemeal strategy. The next one is the seminar. These are the goals. Scrutinize the current theory, study different aspects of the currently accepted theory, and to openly state as many open questions as possible. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to scrutinize each and every aspect of the theory. Everything's going to be open for debate. The second thing is to discuss open questions, brainstorm on currently open questions, and come up with interesting suggestions. That's what we're going to do. And finally, tackle a specific historical or theoretical topic and produce a publishable paper. Now, the best papers produced as a result of this seminar are going to be considered for publication in the journal. So if you believe that you have something to suggest, if you believe that you have an interesting modification to our current knowledge, then you write a paper, you try to publish it, and for that we need a journal. Now, why would anyone need another journal? <laughs> we have millions of journals. Why would we need another journal? The problem that I have with contemporary journals is that they are like a black hole. Let's say you read a series of articles 10 years from their publication. The fact that it's published, what does this tell me in terms of the state of our knowledge? What happened to the ideas in the article? Did they become accepted? Did they remain non-accepted? If you want to answer that question, you have to figure it out for yourself. This is very difficult. What I suggest we do, we trace the fate of suggested modifications. So every article that we publish will come with a list of suggested modifications, which will be, this is the current knowledge. I believe it's nonsense. We have to accept this for whatever reason. This can be a theoretical modification. Let's say you don't like the zeroth law, the first law, one of the theorems, or you have a new theorem to suggest. Or it can be a historical modification. Let's say we currently believe that the 1720 Paris community were Cartesians, and your study shows that they were not Cartesians, that this was something else. Then you publish it in a journal, and you formulate it as an attempt to modify our knowledge. So this is what you believe. This is what I suggest as a replacement. This way, when a paper is published, its suggested modifications become contenders. And every commentator will be asked to comment on specific suggested modifications and decide whether they are acceptable or not. So the fact that the paper is published doesn't make the ideas accepted. We understand that. When the paper is published, the ideas in the paper become contenders. And then it's up to the commentators and the readership to decide whether any of this holds water. Do you think it should be accepted? Or do you think it should remain unaccepted? Meaning pursued further. And then you write your comments as to why you believe that something needs to be accepted or not. 
So this way, after a certain time period, after readers comment on suggested modification and decide which are acceptable and which are not, we will know exactly what the community thinks about a certain modification. And if there is an overwhelming consensus, then we will say, yes, the modification is accepted. So we will take the respective wiki articles that trace the current state of knowledge and we will modify them. If the database needs to be modified, the historical database, we will modify that database. But the point is, at any moment of time, we would know the current state of knowledge. We might be wrong, but at least we know that this is where we stand and we can improve on that, as opposed to not knowing where we stand at all. So this is the point, a piecemeal approach. What happens if there is no consensus? If the community didn't agree on the modification, it will remain pursued and it can become a topic of focus discussion during the workshop. And this is why we need a workshop. The major point of the workshop is to discuss open suggestions, debate on contentious suggestions and evaluate the arguments for and against. So a workshop will provide a format where we'll ideally be able to speed up the process, to gather all together, all interested parties, say what you have to say, and let's hope we'll reach a consensus here and now. So the major task of the workshop is to critically evaluate problematic suggestions with the aim of generating a consensus. And if no consensus is possible, at least try to outline future directions, identify the most topical questions and focus on them in the future research. So this is the point of the workshop. This should not be confused with the seminar because in the seminar we take the current state of knowledge and try to scrutinize it and find as many problems as possible. The task of the workshop is exactly the opposite. We try to reach a consensus. If a consensus is generated, the respective articles of the wiki will be modified according to the resolutions of the workshop. So our state of knowledge will be updated. Now, to recap the toolbox. We need this too to know the current state of theoretical and observational C antonomy. You need both the database and the wiki to know the theory and the tree of knowledge. To scrutinize the current state of knowledge, we need the seminar. To suggest modifications to the current knowledge, we need a journal. And finally, to resolve contentious issues, we need a workshop. This is the point of the toolbox. Any questions about this? Paul? Okay, do you envision the database as consisting of a set of links to journal articles and uh, appropriately classified according to the relevant topic? Is that what you envision at the bottom of this database? That's a very good question. I would say yes. So for every record in a database, we need to have an answer to a simple question. Why is it there? What particular research is it based on? Just like they have it in the tree of life. When you go there, every item is properly cited, properly referenced. So similarly here, and this applies not only to the database, but also to the wiki. Everything we write in a wiki should be properly referenced. Like we believe that this is the current knowledge on a certain subject. Why? Well, because there's this research here and there are these journal articles when it was presented and accepted. Other questions? Mirka? How will participation in the workshops be decided on? It's an interesting question. I have no idea. <laughs> you see, it's very nice when everything is small and cozy, then everybody gets to participate, just like in a Greek democracy. Like you all just gather together and decide things. But what happens if it gets huge? Any ideas? How is this done in proper science? Yeah, Matthew. In terms of the consensus panels, the workshops, there are all kinds of methods like Delphi panels and various other techniques that can be used to draw consensus. There are certainly techniques that are available for workshopping. Now, usually they find people who are experts in the field who have a vested interest in whatever position they're bringing, right? And so you don't want to turn your workshop into truly a democracy. You want to turn it into, you know... Expert democracy. That's right. That really is going after what is the current knowledge base. So I think there are some elementary techniques available in other fields. And that might be really worth exploring. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Now, where do we currently stand? In terms of its existence of this five, only the seminar currently exists. As for the wiki, it's in the making. And if we work hard towards the end of this academic year, we will have something to show to the public. A journal is in the making. The workshop, probably next year, the first time. And for a database, we don't have anything. This is really unfortunate, but the thing is, that's the last thing you can do. You have to clarify your theoretical foundations first before you can delve into reconstructing the tree of knowledge. 
Only when the whole toolbox is in place can we start reconstructing the tree of knowledge. Now, your participation in any of these is a step towards the major goal. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you.